So you've probably seen this before. This is the terminal. On my Mac, it's in a program just called Terminal. On a PC, it's called Command Prompt. So what is it? And also, I always thought it looked outdated and obsolete. So what's with that? And how should somebody use it today? You get used to it. I, I don't even see the code. My name is Ben, and we're gonna answer all three of those questions in this video. So to start, we're going to begin with a history lesson. Computers have been around for a long time, and I don't mean decades, but centuries. Of course, the first computers weren't electronic, but mechanical. Gears, levers, and wheels did all of the work. If you look inside a computer, you find an impressive assembly of basic mechanisms. What's interesting about the first computers is they didn't have a UI or a user interface. If you need clarification on what constitutes a UI, I'm gonna to get to that in a little bit. My point is the earliest mechanical computers were objects that humans interacted with directly. In the mid 20th century, computer scientists sought out a Turing complete computer. I'm designing a machine that will allow us to break every message every day instantly. See, in the early mechanical computers, they were designed to fulfill one task, like navigate or perform arithmetic. To be Turing complete means to be able to compute anything given enough time. Here's an example you might already have experience with. A light-powered four-function calculator included in a school supply kit from Walmart is not Turing complete. Basically does four functions, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. However, the programmable graphing calculator that you may have been required to buy in high school for your math courses is Turing complete. Even though you may have only used it for predefined functions like trig functions or log functions or maybe even some calculus functions, you may have noticed that on the calculator was a button that said program. Whether you used it or not, in that menu you could program or download programs that could do anything, include play games. Now when I say anything, that means provided it's given enough time. The processor on a graphing calculator isn't that impressive, so you're not going to be running something like an Xbox on it. So, back to the history lesson. In the 1940s, Turing complete computers enter the scene. They're for military operations, they take up entire rooms and entire teams of people to operate. They also don't run an operating system or even run programs. Rather, people manipulate the computers by physically changing the circuitry. In other words, they interact with the object directly, treating these new electronic computers much like the early mechanical computers. There was no precedent for anything else, but there was a very clear need. People needed a human-friendly bridge between people and machines, a user interface. Later we find ourselves not manipulating circuitry, but feeding the computer code written in machine language and punched out on cards. The cards weren't anything like programming languages we have today. They actually included instructions for what the computer should do with its actual hardware. When I was researching this, my mind was fantastically blown. Even a command as simple as print didn't exist because computers didn't have operating systems. They had nothing pre-installed on them at all. They were just machines that needed to be told how to do every little thing. So to help programmers with this, when they went to the computer to submit their program, they could check out libraries of card decks that would include some of the basic features that would be needed in any program, like print, for example. Anyway, this system requires less hands on the computer itself. It's a user interface because there's a medium between the people and the machine. People write on a card, card is submitted to the computer, computer executes the commands. But humans are still required to speak that machine code in order to pull this off. Wouldn't it be nice if computers could speak human? Time goes on and we start to figure this out. We can actually solve three problems. First, let's invent operating systems so that those card libraries that I mentioned earlier can be installed on the computer and pre-existing. Secondly, let's eliminate punching cards altogether. Let's invent programming languages human-readable commands that we can send to the computer directly through a keyboard attached to the machine. Thirdly, since we don't have physical stacks of cards anymore, let's stop bringing our program to the computer. Instead, let's bring the computer to us. I'm talking about taking said keyboard, putting it on a long cable, and running it from the mainframe to wherever you are. Hopefully that's not far, and we'll put a little screen on there that you can see what you're typing and what you're sending to the computer. The cable will end there. It'll end with you. That's the end of the line. It's the terminal. But we don't stop there, no. Because we can do better than just the words on the screen. We want pictures, charts and widgets and windows and graphics. Let's even have a mouse so we can click and drag and drop. Graphical user interfaces. 
Yeah. A little more time goes by and we come out with microprocessors. Now computers can be small. We can put a computer in your office. We can give you a personal computer, a PC. And if you want to run your PC through the terminal, you can just take your terminal and attach it to the PC. And wait, well, they both have a keyboard. We could just put a program on the PC like a virtual terminal, a, a simulated one, a, a terminal emulator. Now that is the program on the Mac, on the Windows, terminal command prompt. It's a terminal emulator because it emulates the physical terminal that we used to have. Wait, 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 re rewind, hold on a second. Didn't I say that graphical user interfaces came out later? And those are better, right? Like mouse, graphics, charts, all that stuff. Why are we using a terminal anyway? What could they do with a terminal that they couldn't do with their graphical user interface? Their, their GUI, G-U-Y. I believe that's the essence of the second question, isn't it? As I answer this one, I'm going to draw a picture for you. Over the course of this history lesson, I've laid out this gradient, this gradient of control. In the beginning, programmers could control everything about a computer, including its hardware, like its processors and its memory. The whole physical thing, that's pretty important. So I'm gonna draw a circle around it and I'm gonna call it hardware. And like I was saying, they were writing the program for managing that hardware. And that's the closest thing to the physical object itself. So we're gonna draw a circle around that and we're gonna label it operating system. This amount of control was too much though. We didn't want to write machine code anymore. We wanted to write human readable commands that were independent from the operating system and interacted with it. So I'm gonna put a circle around that. Now, if you look at this diagram, we've got a ring around a ring around a ring, and that outer ring, it's like, it's like a shell, right? So I'm gonna label that shell. Hey, look at that picture. I've got a core and I've got a shell around it. It's like a nut, right? Wouldn't it be cute if I went with a nut metaphor and we called the inside a kernel? Yeah, I'm gonna take out operating system and replace that with kernel. So here's the thing. The farther you get away from the kernel, the less control you have. Any GUI is an application and it fits in this space in the shell. The only difference is when you use a GUI, it's like an added layer that you have to work through. I've never really seen this in any diagrams in my research, but I think it's appropriate since that GUI is an extra layer to just draw it in there and we'll say GUI. Programmers don't want to be here. This is too much control. It's too tedious. They don't want to be here either because this is limiting. They can't control anything that they can't see. This is good for the average user. But this is good for the programmer. This is good for the audience. This is good for the actors. You give the audience a program. You give the actors a script. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to walk into the world of shell scripting. Last question, how should we use this today? I have two answers for you. What you are watching is part of a course on web development. I started with this episode because I'm going to be using the command line for three quintessential programs for which no GUI has improved upon to the extent that it's been widely adopted. Those programs are Git, Node.js, and Firebase. In fact, my very next episode is my episode on Git. So if you wanna see how the command line is used, go ahead and check it out. Second answer, aside from the context of this course, shell scripting is an immensely powerful tool once you become familiar with the commands. It's my intention to explain the overarching principles that other videos leave out. Now that I've talked about what the terminal is, and where it comes from, and why people prefer to use it even though GUIs are available, I think I've given you everything you need to know and the vocabulary you need to go searching for other videos and finding guides that can take you through getting to know it much better. Thank you so much for watching. This is the beginning of a series on web development. If you're interested in future videos on this topic, go ahead and check out the very first episode, really the introduction to all of this, in the video that I'm going to put over here down in the comments. If you have any questions or if you have a request for a video explaining something for which you haven't found a great explanation yet, let me know in the comments. Finally, you can follow me on Twitter at NeverBeenBetter or check out my blog at NeverBeenBetter.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.